Well, good evening. Good to have you back tonight. Uh, we're going to be uh, working our way through uh, chapters 17 and 18. This is our week 12 reading assignment. Week 12, chapters 17 and 18. And uh, after I open a prayer, we'll run through the upcoming weeks so that you have the schedule down. Uh, we're, we're hitting it hard. We're hitting it hard because I want to have this wrapped up before May 19th. So, uh, which means we don't have a lot of time, which means we're thankful we've got a five Sunday month, which means we're thankful that there's no potluck in, uh, in March. So we can have a PMW class on March 31st. All right. Uh, there will not be a PMW class uh, on April 28th because that is a potluck Sunday. Uh, but there will be a PMW class on March 31st. And the reason for that is so that we can wrap up the week 20 reading assignment, chapter 29, uh, for the PMW class on May 12th. All right? And then we'll have this uh, section complete before my trip to Ukraine. And that's, that's the, the real reason to not leave it to where we're hanging with a three-week gap, where we're hanging with such a, a long time between classes. So let me, let me open in prayer, and then we will... Uh, We'll uh, review the upcoming reading assignments, and then we'll get started on last week's reading. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word, the privilege we have tonight to study your word and study about your word, Father, and to review through church history the, the uh, high view of bibliology that has historically been the reality for uh, every branch of Christianity, at least in the early days, Father, until later times. And I pray as we study these things that you would give us a sense of appreciation for our heritage, as well as a sense of determination, Father, to hold fast to that faith which was once and for all, to contend earnestly for the faith which has once and for all been delivered to the saints. So, Father, bless our time in your truth tonight. We thank you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. All right. The reading for tonight, have you done it? Have you read chapter 17 and 18? All right. Did you not read it? Okay, this is your moment for honesty. All right, Daniel. All right. We will, uh, we will get you caught up then. All right, we will get you caught up then. Uh, tonight is easy, though. Tonight is easy. Uh, church fathers on the Bible will deal with here, and then uh, the Reformers will deal with... Um, it is um, fairly straightforward. Uh, it is somewhat uh, maybe dry in some respects. But it is unanimous. That's what I want to highlight. The unanimous nature, at least early in every tradition, the Catholic tradition, the Protestant tradition, the Orthodox tradition, <clears throat> and even among the Protestant, the various branches of Protestants, the Lutheran tradition, the Reformed tradition, the Wesleyan tradition, the Baptist tradition, the various branches, and it doesn't matter. Every time a new stream appears, in the early days, there is a high regard for Scripture. And then later, there are changes that take place. And you're going to observe that. Perhaps not in this week's reading, but in the upcoming readings as we work our way through the chapters. All right? So for tonight, we're going to review chapters 17 and 18. I will watch the clock and make sure we have an evenly divided, proportionate amount of time. I thought we did pretty well with that last time. Uh, in previous sessions, we did not do so well. I say we. I did not do so well watching the clock and would do 58 minutes on the first chapter and then a real hurried two minutes on the, on the second chapter. That's not fair to the even number of chapters of this text. All right, So we'll do a better job on that tonight. I will do a better job on that tonight. Coming up, though, next week, guess what? You've only got one chapter to read next week. It's chapter 19. I haven't read before 7.30, one week from tonight. Don't try to read it during the 6 o'clock hour. You should be listening to the 6 o'clock hour. All right. And don't try reading it in the afternoon. That's nap time. Read it, uh, read it during the week. And if you proportion it out, then you have it read ahead of time. And then you can use Saturday to review and use Sunday to review. All right, Church Fathers on the Bible. Much of what we're going to see tonight will be very beneficial for us when we get to the chapter that pertains to canonicity. Uh, will be, canonicity will be mentioned on a number of occasions in this chapter and the next chapter, but these aren't chapters technically that are dealing with canonicity. So if some of this leaves you wanting more, relax. It's coming up. It will come up in, in the chapter that details canonicity. 
But for now, we're dealing with a historical survey on what uh, the church fathers, uh, what the early church, what the reformers, the, the, the different Christians through the centuries, what their view is on the scripture. It doesn't match up with our view. All right. And remember, we want our view to be shaped by the Bible itself. We don't hold the view we have because, well, that's what the reformers had. That's what the church fathers had. We have the view of scriptures that the, the Bible itself presents. All scripture is God breathed and profitable. No prophecy is a matter of, of a private interpretation, but holy men and prophets of old uh, spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. We recognize this is God's book, not man's book. We, our bibliology is grounded in the scriptures, not church history. Nevertheless, it is interesting to observe through church history where different folks had views similar to ours, even identical to ours, and then where they departed from those views. And when they did depart from those views, how, I think we're going to find, how it sparked a reformation or a revival or a, something new to be birthed out of that where a group of believers wanted to go back to a sound bibliology. We're going to see that time and time again. New denominations, new branches of, of uh, Christianity came out of a desire to return to a pure bibliology. And we'll see if my thesis bears out in the upcoming classes. So the history of the Christian church is an overwhelming support of what the Bible claims for itself, namely to be the divinely inspired, infallible, and inerrant word of God. Well, we've already studied out in chapter 13 on what is inspiration. The, for the most part, overwhelmingly through church history, that has been held to in agreement with how we hold to it. Only in modern times comparatively has the uh, destruction of, uh, of, of liberalism completely redefined everything that we understand in terms of inerrancy, in terms of inspiration. So this is true of the earliest fathers after the time of Christ, as well as down through the centuries following them up to modern times. Just as the New Testament writers assumed the inspiration of the old, the fathers assumed the inspiration of the new. There was never any doubt to them in their minds. Anytime they quoted Peter or Paul or any of the New Testament books, they would say, thus saith the Lord. They would say, Scripture says. They would use the same idioms that the New Testament used when they quoted the Old Testament. And that's important. That's powerful, actually. And if, if a pagan is quoted, if, if an apocryphal book is quoted, if there's allusions to non-biblical works, they can be quoted, but they're never quoted with a thus saith the Lord formula or a scripture says formula or anything even approaching that. See, that becomes important as well. And part of the arguments that Geisler brings out in the process of these two chapters. All right. So the first section of what we're dealing with here. And you're going to notice, by the way, this could go very fast tonight. And you also have no quiz tonight. Hallelujah. All right. Um, only because I think it's much more important that we hold our bibliology based on what we've already studied. Based upon what the Bible says related to itself. The scripture's defense of its own nature. We understand our bibliology is based on the Bible and the Bible alone. We're not going to build our bibliology case on the church fathers or the reformers or even the, uh, the 20th century dispensational, doctrinal, categorical, uh, awesome preachers that we've had here in America and around the world. All right. The church fathers, though, are important because they overlap with the time of the apostles. Some of them are even earlier than our New Testament books. An examination of their writings indicates an early and widespread acceptance of the New Testament claim for inspiration. Just as when Peter cites Paul and calls it scripture, so too do many of their contemporaries. Clement, for example, First Clement is earlier than Revelation as far as the date of its writing. And so it, it, it gives us a contemporary account for what was considered scripture, what was not considered scripture. And that's going to be important for us as we move into the chapter that details canonicity. Because our Bible was not determined to be such by papal decree or by church council or by, it wasn't the Roman church that gave us our Bible. In fact, to this day, the Roman church has a slightly different Bible than we do with some additions that we don't accept. We'll talk about that as we get into the canonicity chapter. All right, the testimony of the epistle of Pseudo-Barnabas. 
And I'm going to say several things related to these early ones that I could say every single time. And maybe I will. The epistle of Pseudo-Barnabas is not Bible. It's not scripture. And we don't believe anything in it because it's coming from the mouth of God. We believe, if we believe anything in it, we believe what's in it that is in agreement with Scripture. <coughs> and if there's something in it that's not in agreement with Scripture, we don't, we're not beholden to it, we don't believe it, we don't trust it because it's not Scripture. It's Scripture that's God-breathed and profitable. But we do find in it cooperation of Scripture and a testimony that gives us a very clear idea how this author, whoever he was, he wasn't the real Barnabas, but that's why it's called pseudo-Barnabas. Whoever the author was held an esteem of Scripture that we can identify. And that comes out in his writings. So, um, it was later wrongly ascribed to Barnabas, so I think, you know, traveled with Paul, and I think it was the author of Hebrews, but um, regardless, whoever the author was, we don't have to know who he was. This work cites the Gospel of Matthew, and it introduces it in a what God saith formula. All right. So this work cites the Gospel of Matthew, but introduces it with this is what God saith. And thus saith the Lord formula. Identifying that it wasn't the words of Matthew there. It was God's words as recorded by Matthew. So it's what we would defend in terms of our own understanding of inspiration. The same writer refers to the Gospel of Matthew by the New Testament title, Scripture which the New Testament says is inspired or breathed out by God. And so I don't know how much of the, the time I'm going to spend um, bringing these up. I have most of these actually in my Libronic software. We could, we could spend time reading these apocryphal works, reading these church, fa I'm sorry, church father works, okay? Greek and English, both. Many of them are now available in uh, the Logos Bible software. But he cites the Gospel of Matthew, it's one of the values of studying the church fathers. If we had no New Testament manuscripts at all, we could reconstruct the New Testament just based on how the church fathers quoted the New Testament as much as they did. And so we have the formulas in God saith, the, uh, even calling uh, the Gospel of Matthew Scripture. And so there's testimony very early that the, the date of this epistle is ranged anywhere from 70 to 130 A.D., all right. After the destruction of Jerusalem, but very early, either late first century or early second century, um, depending on the, the estimate of a scholar that's uh, trying to date these things. All right, Clement of Rome, his first epistle to the Corinthians is earlier than Revelation. It's 95 A.D., 95, 97 thereabout. Okay, when was Revelation written? About that same time frame, 96 usually is thought of. Clement of Rome, also a contemporary of the apostles, wrote his epistle after the pattern of Paul. He writes a letter to the Corinthians. You know, they didn't just receive the two letters from Paul, they received additional letters. They weren't Bible letters. Okay. And it's remarkable. The church fathers knew they weren't writing scripture. They made a distinction between their own writings and scripture. That becomes significant. So in, in 1 Clement, if you read his writings, he quotes the Synoptic Gospels. He quotes Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And he calls them Scripture. Not the writings of man, but God's writings. Scripture. He urges his readers to act according to that which is written. Right? Does that remind you of Jesus? It is written. For the Holy Spirit saith, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. So he's got these same appeals to the inspiration by the Holy Spirit that the New Testament has. He further appeals to the Holy Scriptures, which are true, given by the Holy Spirit. He, uh, when he cites the New Testament, he says, it is written. He quotes Paul as being, it is written. Defending the uh, apostolic nature of Paul's ministry and the nature of the New Testament as the Scripture, same as the Old Testament. Polycarp, his epistle to the Philippians. I like Polycarp. He was a disciple of the Apostle John. And several times he makes these references. He refers to the New Testament several times in his epistle. He uh, has a quotation of Galatians 4.26 that he calls the word of truth. These are the references that you see here. He cites as the word of righteousness. In chapter 12 of Polycarp's epistle to the Philippians, he uh, cites numerous Old and New Testament passages and he calls them all the scriptures. 
the Scripture. So the church fathers had the same view of the New Testament, put it on par with the Old Testament. All right? And this is fundamentally what's going to define canonicity is these are the Scriptures that were received by the church as they were written by God when he breathed through those apostles to write the New Testament text. And the churches received them and identified them as Scripture at the time at the time that they were received. Just by the way, how the Old Testament was received by Israel. At the time that God breathed through Moses, he breathed through Samuel, they breathed through each of the writing prophets. Their written work was accepted by Israel as God breathed and inspired and it was added to their canon. Papias. We don't have the originals of Papias. We just have citations of Papias from others. In any event, Papias wrote five books titled Exposition of the Oracles of the Lord. Interestingly enough, Paul said that Israel was entrusted with the oracles of God. What, what advantage have the Jews? They were entrusted with the oracles of God. And uh, interestingly enough, Papias has such a high regard for the New Testament, he gives the New Testament that title. That, that what we have are the oracles of the Lord. Israel had their advantage, we have our advantage. We're the stewards of the New Testament truth. And he's right. He's right. In addition to these very early books that cite the New Testament, there are several others that allude to it as Scripture. Ignatius of Antioch, Shepherd of Hermes, the Didache, the Epistles of Diogenes, all of which cite the, uh, the New Testament and call it Scripture defending the doctrine of inspiration as we would teach the doctrine of inspiration. That is the word of God, thus saith the Lord, that the Holy Spirit says through these various authors. So taken together, this important early material demonstrates that by about AD 150, the early church, both east and west, accepted the New Testament claim for divine inspiration. It was never, ever in doubt in the early church. All right. It was never in doubt in the medieval church, never in doubt in the Reformation church. Not until the destructions of, uh, of, of liberal theology in the 19th century did then this vain idea about, well, God didn't really write the Bible start to come onto the world stage. Guys, we'll take us through uh, those events here in the upcoming chapter. Anti-Nicene and Nicene Fathers. So we get to the next stage of church history. Okay? Anti, A-N-T-E. Right? Not anti, but anti. So before the Council of Nicaea, after the Council of Nicaea. This gets us from the range of about 150 to 350. Uh, so we got other testimony. Justin Martyr, Tatian, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, and others. You ever heard of these guys to do much reading in the Church Fathers? I, I find it enjoyable. I, I like it. It's, it's edifying. It's encouraging. But, but we can't allow ourselves to be snared. They got a lot of stuff wrong. All right? We shouldn't be surprised about that. The, the Apostolic Church got a lot of stuff wrong. That's why we have 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. And, you know, during the, during the lifetime of the Apostles, they wrote the New Testament to correct what believers got wrong. So it's not surprising that after the apostles are gone, the church fathers get some stuff wrong. Nevertheless, we can learn, and we can glean what their convictions were, and uh, there is value in that, great value in that. Justin Martyr spoke of the Gospels as the voice of God. Tatian, he calls John 1.5, he calls it Scripture. Again, testimony that... John didn't write it, it's the Word of God. All Scripture is God read the prophet. He calls John 1 5 Scripture. He also wrote a Harmony of the Gospels, the first, the first walk, uh, Harmony of the Gospels. I didn't invent the idea with my Lap of Christ series. Okay, it goes back to uh, Tatian, who wrote the Diatessaron, the Harmony of the Four Gospels. And he viewed it as all God breathed, all inspired, and all true. No contradictions. We don't fall for the either-or trap to say, well, Matthew must have been right and Mark must have been wrong. He harmonized as we do. Everything God says is true. Irenaeus, by now we're crossing into the uh, 
the next century, from 130 to 202. Irenaeus is reported to have actually heard the teachings of Polycarp, disciple of the Apostle John. So now we're into the third generation. He didn't hear John, but he heard Polycarp who heard John. And he writes a treatise against heresies, referring to the divine authority of the New Testament. Here's a quote from Irenaeus. For the Lord of all gave the power of the gospel to his apostles, through whom we have come to know the truth, that is, the teaching of the Son of God. This gospel they first preached. Afterward, by the will of God, they handed it down to us in the scriptures to be the pillar and ground of our faith. Where's that phrase, pillar and ground, come from? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? First Timothy. All right. The pillar and support of the truth. The church of the living God. All right. I know, you're tired. It's not fair of me to throw that out. I told you there was no quiz tonight, and I quiz you. My fault. All right. In fact, Irenaeus affirmed his belief in the inerrancy of Scripture, not just inspiration, but inerrancy, proclaiming the faith in Scripture and tradition in which he acknowledged the apostles to be above falsehood. They could not write error under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does the Roman Church do today? They take that same thing and they apply it to papal, papal infallibility, right? When he's seated in ex cathedra speaking on behalf of the... No. That was limited to the apostles in the writing of the New Testament text. Irenaeus was most properly assured that the scriptures are indeed perfect since they are spoken by the word of God and his spirit. Clement of Alexandria. Now Clement... The Alexandria school is very problematic, all right, because of their hermeneutic. We're not going to allow our rejection of their hermeneutic to cloud our reading as we appreciate their defense of the source of Scripture. So they did bad things with the Bible when they allegorized everything they came across, <laughs> okay? And we don't want to do that. But let's not... Um, dismiss what we read related to Clement or Origen or any of the Alexandrian school because they handled it improperly with a bad hermeneutic. They still accepted it for what it was, the God-breathed truth. And there's great value in that. In fact, they debated with some of the heretics that uh, related to that. Some of it uh, I won't read about coming up in the canonicity question. So Clement became the head of the church school at Alexandria in 190 but was compelled to flee in the face of persecution in 202. He held to a strict doctrine of inspiration which can be seen in his stromata. This also is available in Lagos. I don't want to read all of these and in fact I've got to keep it moving or we'll uh, use up the whole hour just in this one chapter. Tertullian, father of Latin theology. Now, he's Western, he's writing in Latin uh, there's going to be some doctrines we're not going to go with him on, but he has the same view of inspiration that we have. The same view of the, of the inerrancy of Scripture. That the Scripture is not the writing of man, the Scripture is the writing of God. Tertullian says, The apostles have the Holy Spirit properly, who have him fully, in the operations of prophecy, in the efficacy of virtues, and the evidences of tongues, not particularly as all others have. Thus he attached the Holy Spirit's authority to that form to which he willed us rather to attend. And forthwith it became not an advice of the Holy Spirit, but in consideration of his majesty, a precept. In other words, the signs and wonders attested to the legitimacy as God's messengers, and their writings are not helpful hints for today's uh, believers. They are the commandments of Scripture. They are a New Testament to be added to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Hippolytus a disciple of Irenaeus. So now how many generations down are we? All right. <clears throat> he exhibited the same deep sense of reverence towards Scripture. And uh, it's, it's kind of, this is kind of interesting because he speaks of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the law and the prophets were from God, who in giving them compelled his messenger to speak by the Holy Spirit, that receiving the inspiration of the Father's power, they may announce the Father's counsel and will. In these men, therefore, the word found a fitting abode and spoke of himself. For even then he came as his own herald, showing the word 
capitalized, you know, Jesus was the word, was about to appear in the world. So not only was the Old Testament inspired, but the Old Testament was pointing forward to the coming of Christ. And then of the New Testament writers, he goes on. These blessed men, having been perfected by the spirit of prophecy and worthily honored by the word himself, were brought to an inner harmony like instruments and having the word within them as if as it were to strike the notes by him, they were moved and announced that which God wished. Now I think the mechanics is a bit off. We wouldn't use the musical instrument analogy or the stenographer analogy. They weren't word processors. They didn't lose their own intellect and will and personality as they wrote. I think the musical instrument um, metaphor is not a, not a good explanation. Nevertheless, he, uh, he still rightly acknowledges that they were writing what God would have them write. That just like the Old Testament, the New Testament comes to us by the will of God. All right. So, uh, afterwards, well foretold the future by visions, and then when thus assured, they spake that which was revealed to them alone by God. So the New Testament authors, just like the Old Testament authors, are giving a revelation from God himself. Origin, another the Alexandrian school, Cyprian, important bishop in the Western Church. Eusebius of Caesarea, the first church historian. Let's see. He is the one that uh, was commissioned to make 50 copies of the scriptures following the Council of Nicaea. The high uh, value that they held to the scriptures, they used state funds, the Roman Empire funds, to produce 50 copies. This is an astronomical fortune. The cost of books in the ancient world was incredible. And 50 uh, copies of the scriptures is an extraordinary expense. Athanasius, the father of orthodoxy, he was the first to use the term canon and uh, create the list that, uh, as we know it today, Cyril of Jerusalem. So here's the summary. Virtually every church father enthusiastically adhered to the doctrine of the inspiration of the Old and New Testaments alike. We would be very like-minded with any of the church fathers as it pertains to inerrancy, as it occurs to, I'm sorry, inspiration. Inspiration. God wrote the Bible. In short... The fathers of the early church believed that both the Old and the New Testaments were the inspired writings of the Holy Spirit through the instrumentality of the prophets and the apostles. They also believed the scriptures were completely true and without error because they were the very word of God given for the faith and practice of all believers. For the faith and practice of all believers. And we would agree in totality. All right. Now this is where I'm supposed to be done with this chapter. Move on to the next chapter. Uh, the next section is the medieval church teachers. So there's Ambrose. There's Jerome. Who gave us the Vulcan? I mean, this man knew his languages. This man knew his text. This man did not uh, include the Apocrypha. Different things we'll talk about when we talk about uh, um, canonicity. The Syrian school in Antioch, much better school. We'd have been very happy with that school because they had a literal hermeneutic and they approached the scriptures as you and I would approach the scriptures. Okay? And yet they had like mindedness with the Alexandrian school as far as the fact that. God wrote the Bible. Augustine of Hippo, and starting with Augustine, then we start to get some other problem areas because he starts allegorizing. He then later in his life started blending in some Greek philosophy, but nevertheless, he held a uh, inspiration. God wrote the Bible. Gregory the Great would defend inspirations, you and I would. And of Canterbury, the Victorines in the 12th century. Thomas Aquinas, now we're up to the 13th century. And still, the author of Holy Scripture is God. You know, Thomas Aquinas found, uh, found fit to tweak some things of, of Augustine and change a lot of other things and then put his own stamp on theology. He's a doctor of the Western Church. Um, but he stands forth and says, the author of the Holy Scriptures is God. Okay? We have like-mindedness with what you and I teach to this day. God is the author of Scripture. Inerrancy. 
Here we start to find some distinctions, but I'm going to pass by that. Superiority of Scripture. Summary and conclusion. There may have been minor differences with regard to the mode of inspiration, how he did it, some of the metaphors they came up with, the musical instrument analogy, and so forth. Nevertheless, they all had a unanimous agreement, or virtual unanimous agreement, that the Old and New Testaments were the divinely authoritative and verbally inspired Word of God, having final authority for faith and practice of the church. Unanimous. Unanimous. All right, that's chapter 17. We move on to... Reformation and so forth. Any questions on anything as of now? I say this could be pretty easy. In upcoming chapters, though, we're going to start to see, well, when did Rome change? (laughs) Okay? And they never really changed on their views of the Scriptures. What changed was their views of their own traditions, which they then elevated to be equal to the Scriptures. But they never really changed their views of the Scriptures. Kind of, sort of. Trent, they did when they added their deuterocanonical books. They added some additional books to try to defend some of the practices that the Protestants were up in arms about. Um, So, yeah, they they brought in a few apocryphal books then. But by and large, they've kept the same bibliology in the sense that God wrote the Old Testament, God wrote the New Testament. That hasn't changed. Okay? They then elevated their. Traditions, their council decisions, their papal, infallible papal decrees and things of that nature to be put on par with Scripture. They then said, yes, all Scripture is God-breathed, but only we can interpret it. That becomes a problem, right? Nevertheless, their doctrine of inspiration is the same as ours in many respects. All right, on to the Reformers. Martin Luther, well, what do you expect? He was an Augustinian monk, okay? So he's going to be very much in line with Augustine. Calvin, very much in line with Augustine. To this day, Reformed theology. All your Calvinists out there, very Augustinian. Like many early medieval fathers before him, Luther believed the Bible came from God through the instrumentality of the men God used. And so he did not deviate from standard orthodox view of Scripture. All the solas of, of the Reformation... Uh, one thing they, they didn't have any dispute with, any argument with, any difference from the Roman church, that God wrote the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God. Much of different quotes. I think in the interest of time, I won't read through those. Although a couple of them really I, I enjoyed greatly. The infallibility and inerrancy of Scripture. Okay, I'll read this one. Luther proclaimed, um, Neither does it help them to assert that all other points they have a high and noble regard for God's word and the entire gospel, except in this matter. My friend, God's word is God's word. This point does not require much haggling. When one blasphemously gives the lie to God in a single word or says it is a minor matter if God is blasphemed or called a liar, one blasphemies the entire God and makes light of all blasphemy. We better take it seriously. If God uttered one lie in Scripture, He's not the God that we have trusted in for our eternal life. In any event, there's more. Summary of Luther's views. John Calvin, likewise. 1509 to 1564, founder of the Reformed tradition. So today that would be your, all your various Calvinists, including your Presbyterians, many of your Baptists, other groups. And he repeatedly was emphatic about the divine inspiration and inerrancy of Scripture, as was Augustine, Aquinas, and Luther. Believed the Bible found its ultimate source in God. The very words of the Bible came from the mouth of God, albeit through the instrumentality of man. The Bible has come down to us from the mouth of God, he said. We owe the same reverence to the Bible that we owe to God. Do you agree with that? Is the Bible God? 
We don't worship the Bible because the Bible is not God, but he has magnified his word in accordance with his name. So since he has magnified it that way, we better magnify it that way and show the appropriate reverence and fear of Scripture as we would in the fear of the Lord. I agree with that. Of course, it's conveyed through humans. Of course, the manuscripts have been copied and there are errors in the manuscripts. Calvin affirmed that it was the original autographs that are without error. Calvin's conclusion. So long as your mind entertains any misgivings as to the certainty of the word of God, its authority will be weak and dubious. Or rather, it will have no authority at all. And he is right. He is right on target. And this is why the, the uh, higher criticism and, the, and the, the German liberals were so destructive to this day. You've got believers who don't trust their Bibles because they don't think God wrote their Bibles. And to this day, they have a dubious, uh, they have misgivings as to the certainty of the Word of God. They have doubts because the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And science says, in the beginning, Big Bang and evolution and blah, blah, blah. And so they have doubts as to the scriptures. And then they try to say, well, we don't trust the Bible's science, but we still walk according to the Bible's moral commandments. As if we can have a partly trustworthy Bible and a partly ridiculous Bible. Okay. As Calvin says, so long as your mind entertains any misgivings as to the certainty of the word of God, its authority will be weak and dubious. Rather, it will have no authority at all. And I agree with that. Nor is it sufficient to believe that God is true and cannot lie or deceive unless you feel firmly persuaded that every word which proceeds from him is sacred, inviolable truth. And that's the case. That's what the Bible says. God breathed and profitable. Calvin believed that there are errors in the copies of the manuscripts, of course. And he thinks, by the way, that in Matthew 27, when the name Jeremiah is in there, that's in there by mistake. That it should be Zechariah. We've been studying that in the life of Christ lately. You know, about the potter's field. Matthew said that it was spoken of through Jeremiah. And we go back and we find the quote actually comes out of Zechariah. Calvin said, well, that must have been a manuscript copy error. Evangelical tradition after Calvin. Ulrich Zwingli followed uh, Calvin in Geneva. John Knox took the Calvinism into Scotland and becomes the official Church of Scotland doctrine. I even had a, I think a 14th, I forget how many, I had a descendant of John Knox in my home one day. He's here in Austin somewhere, he's a plumber, all right, and he came and he was fixing something in our home one day, and his last name was Knox, and he said he was direct descendant back how many generations, and he didn't know much more beyond that, didn't even know who John Knox was, except some famous guy in church history. <laughs> That's sad. All these different... Um, Confessions, these different articles, they all confirm that God wrote the Bible. The Belgic Confession, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Canons of Dort, the Belgic Confession, the Remonstrance of the uh, Arminians, this powerful Calvin Arminian debate, both sides said God wrote the Bible. They had a fear of the Scriptures based on the fact that it is written, God said. Arminius devoted six of his 79 private disputations to the nature, authority, and adequacy of Scripture. We can profit from that today. The Synod of Dort, which was the Calvinist con uh, condemnation of the Arminian view, contains five articles devoted to the Scriptures. Westminster tradition. Church of England. Why do we have a Church of England? Because King Henry wanted a divorce. <laughs> Pope wouldn't give him one. All right. We have our own church. It's kind of remarkable because there were some Protestant influences that tried to introduce Lutheran and Calvinistic writings into England at this time. And it's kind of interesting that the Church of England broke free from Rome but kept primarily a, a Roman outlook on things in terms of their liturgy, in terms of their doctrine, in terms of their belief. They just made the king their, their high, the king of England their, the top of their hierarchy instead of the, the Pope in Rome. Nevertheless, 
God wrote the Bible according to the Westminster tradition. The Wesleyan tradition. After the American Revolution, John Wesley drew up the 25 Articles of Religion adopted by the American Methodists in 1784. You know what it says? God wrote the Bible. Okay? I'm not sure if I can find it. The other day I was on the United Methodist Church website and uh, explored their official positions on homosexuality, their official positions on women in ministry, their official positions on a variety of different things that the liberal churches have really struggled with, um, primarily because my Boy Scout troop, my son's Boy Scout troop, or my Boy Scout troop, Bob actually graduated out of it, um, they're, they're sponsored by the United Methodist Church. And right now there's all these debates going forth within the Boy Scouts as to whether or not Boy Scouts are going to change their policy related to homosexual scoutmasters. And uh, so I'm reading through this site and I'm, I'm learning some things about today's Methodist Church that I don't think would have sat well with the Wesleys. And their view of Scripture, they still say God wrote the Bible, but then they elevate other things along with it. And it's the same heresy that the Roman Church did when the Roman Church elevated their, their church councils and papal decrees and, and church traditions and so forth. And they've, eleva and they've elevated our own reason and experience to on par with the Scriptures. In any event, I'm not going to take the time tonight to hunt for that again. I will find it before next Sunday, though. We'll actually have some time coming up because the later chapters show, I think, the destructive influence of the uh, higher criticism in the, in, in the 19th century and how it affected liberal Christianity to this day. And in most respects, all it is is an attack upon inspiration of Scripture. Today, people will tell you that God didn't write this. All right, and that's a sad commentary on the last two centuries of church history. So there's the Wesleyan tradition. Hmm. The absolute authority and total reliability of the Bible was taken for granted in early Wesleyanism as emphatically as motherhood has been assumed to be the principle for the survival of the human race. <laughs> Nothing would have been more repugnant to the original Methodism than to cast doubt on the Word of God, the very source of life. You know, and you start to wonder, what would the Wesleys think of uh, their church today? What would Luther think of his church today? What would Calvin think of his church today? I guess the real question is, what would Jesus think of his church today? Right? Irish Wesleyan Adam Clark. Do you have his commentaries? They are worthwhile, but just know where they're coming from. <coughs> Clark was genius in many of the things that he wrote about, but just know that he was Wesleyan. Know what his theology is. His belief, he affirmed his belief in the plenary inspiration and infallibility of Scripture as the only complete directory of faith and practice of man. Richard Watson the first systematic theologian of the Wesleyan movement, he defended this, the sacred writers and their works under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The sacred writers composed their works under so plenary and immediate an influence of the Holy Spirit that God may be said to speak by them to man, not merely that they spoke to men in the name of God and by his authority. Truly what we understand is God breathed, they are God's words through the tools that he used. It was not until the opening years of the 20th century that Methodism moved from its moorings in, of this high view of Scripture. We'll talk about why the different churches went liberal when they did. Anabaptist and Baptist tradition. John Wycliffe, John Huss, Balthasar Hubmeyer, Martin, I'm not sure if it's Booster, Booker. I've heard it pronounced both ways, and I suspect that uh, somebody's wrong. Menno Simons. We got the Anabaptists and the Mennonites and all their convictions. God wrote the Bible. Interesting, even though Baptists tend to avoid creedal statements, they still have them, and they still hold to the fact that God wrote the Bible. The Second London Confession, for example, that came to this country in Philadelphia. In the 19th century, Baptists in both the northern and southern United States came to use the shorter 
moderately Calvinistic statement called the New Hampshire Declaration of Faith. You know what it says? God with the Bible. Southern Baptist said the name is strengthened in their declaration. All right, the Roman Catholic view on Scripture. The traditional teaching on the doctrine of the inspiration and answer of Scripture is based on the teaching of the Church Fathers, such as Augustine and Aquinas. So they would tell you, God wrote the Bible. <coughs> Even the great Protestant reformers never changed the Roman Catholic view on the origin and nature of Scripture. Where they went different was on the interpretation of Scripture and the application of Scripture. In other words, how are, is the righteousness of God applied to man? Is it by faith alone? Or do I need the mediation of the, of the Mother Church to take the merits of Christ through Mary to, uh, you know, through the legal observance of the Mass to, uh, to cause me to earn and deserve the, uh, the grace they use grace like something you can work for and earn and deserve. It's, it's almost, it is sickening to talk about in some of the ways that they do. So they never changed the origin and nature of Scripture. The differences with the Catholic Church were over the extent of the canon and the interpretation of it. How do we interpret the Scripture? Can we interpret the Scripture? They say we can't. Without the apostolic succession, without the anointing, it's only the, the, the holy Roman Catholic Church that is the right custodian of the scriptures and interpreter of the scriptures. The official Roman Catholic position in the canons and dogmatic decrees of the Council of Trent, 1563. That's a high view of uh, that God and God alone is the author of both the Old and the New Testaments. Okay, from the mouth of Christ himself or by the apostles, by the dictation of the Holy Spirit, transmitted as it were from hand to hand. Okay, God wrote the Bible, got that. Problem is, is where they say we and we alone can interpret it for you. Let's see, Vatican II. Carl F. Henry. And it's kind of interesting, that same spirit of liberalism that affected the Protestant West also affected the Roman Church as well. That's why they've uh, modified some of their understandings of Scripture as it they start to allow the, the doubts of modern science and so forth. Um, some of the liberals within the Roman tradition try to find legal room in that view. Orthodox Church, all right? The Orthodox Church, Eastern Orthodox. Greek Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, anything that's Orthodox um, has as its legacy not the Roman West, but the Greek-speaking East, the Eastern Church Fathers. They never went to Latin. They always uh, wrote in Greek and, and taught in Greek and thought in Greek and transmitted manuscripts in Greek. They never went to the Latin in the Western traditions. And uh, you know what their view is? God wrote the Bible. <laughs> okay? God wrote the Bible. Summary and conclusion. A survey of the history of the Christian church from the Reformation to recent times reveals that there is virtually unanimous consent. And if you walk away from here... With nothing else than this, this is the main point. We all agree, at least originally, our branches of Christianity all agreed that God wrote the Bible. That the scriptures are God-breathed and inspired. Whether it's Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant, every branch of Christianity has held to this understanding. It's not the traditions of men compiled over years and blah, blah, blah. That's liberal destruction. We deal with it to this day. It's accepted as fact. It's conventional wisdom today. Bill O'Reilly's spouting off on his show a tragic understanding of what the Bible is. And I think a lot of it's because of his Catholicism. 
Okay? And, and what's happened in the recent centuries related to how we understand, how we interpret the Bible. So a survey of the history of Christian church from the Reformation to recent times reveals that there is virtually unanimous consent that the Bible is the divinely inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God. This follows the basic view of the early church. Deviations from this view were extremely rare, and generally when they were, they were condemned. Different church councils would condemn any, any position that, that modified the idea that God wrote the Bible. Until the late 19th century, when liberalism and neo-orthodoxy, neo-orthodoxy. Now, if orthodoxy is the right, uh, the just, the, um, the, the just cutting, when I, we rightly divide the word of truth. Orthodoxy means we are lined up with what God has revealed in his word. So how could you have a neo-orthodoxy? We're going to update the scriptures a little bit? What are we going to do? Anyway, liberalism, chapter 20. Neo-orthodoxy, chapter 21. Challenge the long-standing position of the Christian church, both East, West, Catholic, and Protestant. And it's actually infested the entire thing, planet-wide. Now, where have the best defenses come from? It hasn't been Orthodox or Catholic. I think the best resistance and refutations of the liberalism has come in the Protestant circle, specifically American evangelicalism. American evangelicalism has had the shining response against the liberalism that crept in in that 19th century. There'll be more to say about that as we get into those later chapters. All right, any questions here on chapter 18? Just yes, sir. And let's get a microphone. We need to do a microphone. I missed this a couple weeks ago. Thank you. All right. We don't want the uh, recordings to come out sounding like half a telephone conversation. Uh, my question actually is it on? Yes. When we talk about the sources that the, for the NIV and those, did those come from those guys that we're talking about in Alexandria or? No. That's, that's a different issue. And the problem is, yeah, uh, the word Alexandria becomes a buzzword. Okay? Uh, don't, uh, many of the early Uncial manuscripts that uh, Codex Sinaiticus, Alexandrinus, Vaticanus, uh, many of the early Uncial manuscripts are from that geography, from that region. But it's different then the, the, the manuscript origin is not the allegorical interpretations and traditions. See? And the problem is, 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 is these reactionaries like Kiplinger and some of these folks that write the King James only stuff, um, they will attack the Alexandrian manuscripts as if they are equal to the Alexandrian allegorical interpretation of Scripture. It's not the same. It's, just, it's like trying to attack, you know, something Alexandrian that applies to, you know, an entirely different Alexandrian. It just makes no sense. But they associate the word, so then they, they draw their attack. They do the same thing, by the way, with, uh, with Westcott. Of Westcott and Hort, they accuse Westcott of being a demoniac, of being a spiritist, of being involved in witchcraft and all this other stuff. And they're confusing two different people named Westcott that are dozens of years apart. Uh, I think one's a nephew of the other one. And the one that they malign is a God-fearing man that reverenced the scriptures in the ways they never will. And I find that to be tragic. Good question. Any other questions? All right, for next week then, you want to read chapter 19, all on its own. It's one single chapter. The History of Destructive Biblical Criticism. And I'm telling you, you're going to like it. Well, you're not going to like it. You're going to like it and not like it at the same time. Okay? You're going to like it in that it's going to provide you the information I've been talking about for weeks now. You're not going to like it because it's going to break your heart. Some of it's going to make you mad because they're going to malign the God you love and the scriptures you love. They're going to have a terrible, tragic uh, bibliology. That's why we're having this class. 
We want to be equipped with a biblical bibliology and a proper reverence for what God himself has magnified in accordance with his name. It's one of the unique things of all creation. His son in the flesh is unique in all creation. And his word in human languages is theanthropic. It's unique in human history. So uh, when you see how destructive this was and how it still damages us to this day, I think you'll have a, a better appreciation for it. Uh, why this is important to study. Also, you'll be a little bit better equipped to talk to some of your friends, maybe that have a pretty dim view of the scriptures. And maybe you can kind of bring them along to say, well, you know, I think this is what the Bible is all about, and your tradition is taking you down a very dangerous road. This chapter will be very beneficial for us in that regard. So uh, read it, read it with a lot of uh, eagerness, and I think you're going to be blessed. Make sure you're in fellowship before you start <laughs> All right. Heavenly Father, thank you for tonight. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your faithfulness. And Father, I just uh, so rejoice. Uh, thank you for the, the dedication of Norman Geisler and his work to produce this uh, systematic theology, for the blessings and benefit that it is for us today, and he will continue to bear fruit for months and years ahead, Father, for all eternity even. We thank you uh, for the privilege we have to, uh, to study such things. And we give you the praise and the glory, Father, in Christ Jesus' name. Amen.